Yo, what's up guys? If you haven't finished the game even once, then think twice before watching this video, because there will be a lot of spoilers. For everyone else, timestamps are below, and let's do it. First of all, you need to be sure that you do understand core and important mechanics of the game. Second of all, there is a lot of variables and also there is a huge amount of choices you can make. And thus, I think that there is no single right way to do an honor run. And so we're gonna talk only about very specific and dangerous encounters for your honor run. Oh, and keep in mind, if you do a solo run, you should multiply the danger by 100 because there is way less room for a mistake. So buckle up, there will be a lot of information. The deadliest thing for any build out there is lava. The only thing which can save you from it is either overcapped fire resistance or being under the effect of living on the edge. But both of those options could be done only preemptively. So if you stepped into a lava without those safety measures, then you're probably dead. And thus, remembering lava encounters is crucial if you don't want to immediately lose your run, especially if you play with a solo character. You don't have to worry about that in Act 1, but in Act 2, there is a very deadly lava encounter and that is Hanak in Cloisterwood. Not only there is a lava pile right next to her, but she's also able to cast a lava portal on top of your head. It can happen either when you fight her or when she sees your characters and you run around or towards her for more than a couple of seconds. In order to prevent that, you can deal with the Magisters in front of her first, then it will be safe to approach her. But if you decide to spare Magisters, then you'd better use sneaking or invisibility to come close to her and trigger the dialogue. Invisibility is a safer option for multiple reasons, just don't step into the damage surface. Act 3 has several lava encounters. Firstly, there's a giant lava area in the east part of the map, so be extremely careful out there. You may jump there for extra loot and misclick on the lava surface, and voila, you've just lost 50 hours of your progress. Secondly, if you fight the Shadow Prince and his gang, then pay attention to this alchemist guy, cause he can TP you into lava. Thirdly, Emergency Flush Protocol. In the Pocket Imp Dimension, if you have an urge to touch random valves, you will end up choking on death fog and then you'll be sprayed with lava. No one is safe there. So under any circumstances, do not touch emergency flush protocol valve or you'll regret this. But hyperdrive protocol valve is fine because it's gonna give you haste. In the same area, when you come closer to this core, you're gonna enter the combat. Main thing is to reach the core and touch it before its turn. Cause if you want, it will release scripted death fog and lava which kills absolutely anyone. So do not delay your turn. Jumping skills and TP is a big help here. Oh, on top of that, do not choose this dialogue option, because it also releases the same scripted Lava Deathlock mix. And finally, right after the race for a Godwoken status, you'll encounter your gods. During this fight, three random lava eruptions will fall on the ground each round. Initial eruption only does small fire damage, but on the next turn, it will pour hot, hard, thick liquid on your face if you decide to stand right beneath it. You don't have to worry about lava in Act 4. Next, Shriekers. They're pretty easy to deal with by using Source Vampirism, but you can make a very simple mistake and lose the run. Pathing system in this game will sort of try to avoid any harmful surfaces like lava for example, but it doesn't work well all the time, and it certainly is not gonna work on Shriekers. Meaning, you might click on a certain area, forget that there are Shriekers ahead, then get off the computer to get some tea. Meanwhile, your party is gonna walk into the crucified boys who are gonna end your run. Pretty sad. So just remember Shrieker's locations and you'll be fine. In Act 1, there is one Shrieker next to the area where you save Gareth. And there are five others guarding Alexander. In Act 2, there are a couple of Shriekers right before Magister Raymond. You can find him next to the oil rig where you hopelessly try to save Private Gavin. Another Shrieker is in the Black Pit's mines. In Act 3, you're gonna see Shriekers only next to the Tirsendalius camp. For some reason, sometimes they're pretty harmless though. But I wouldn't test my luck if I were solo. And as far as I know, there are no crucified boys in Act 4. Next, Death Fog. Pretty self-explanatory. You walk into this, you die. Skills like Living on the Edge or Breathing Bubble will save you from it for a few turns. But keep in mind that under the effect of those skills, you will still get a Death Fog status, which in some situations might expire later than your protective skills if you time it wrong. And as you can imagine, this will have a very sad outcome. Also, it might not save you from some encounters like getting on the Undead Fairy in Act 2, because it's scripted, so you will die anyway. And as I mentioned earlier, do not trust pathing system. If you see a death fog as an obstacle, then casting surface cleaning abilities like tornado or throw dust will help. Oh, and also try not to jump over death fog by using wings. It's gonna kill ya. 
Normal jump skills should be fine, just don't misclick. Alright, let's get to the encounters. You have nothing to fear Deathhawk wise in Act 1. Act 2. Reaching Blood Moon Island by using Undead Ferryman is lethal. This is a scripted death and even living on the edge isn't gonna save you. There are several ways to bypass it. Either go to the bridge next to the driftwood fields and get to the island through a secret passage. Or use one of your companions to reach the island via Undead Ferry. Yes, it's still deadly, but we do it this way. You unchain the party and send one of the companions on a boat trip. That lucky volunteer dies for sure, but you can TP the rest of your party on the corpse once it arrives to the island. You just need to shove the pyramid into it. This second option is a no-no if you have a solo character, for obvious reasons. You're just gonna die. Other option is to have an activated idol of rebirth on you. You reach the island, you die, but the idol of rebirth is gonna resurrect you. But to be honest, uh, the secret bridge option is the safest one for sure. If you decide to fight the ferryman, keep in mind that he can cast Death Fog Breath. It is extremely deadly. Oh, also he can teleport and nether swap you into Death Fog. If you want to get Captain's Compass and the Reaper's Cove, then be extremely careful and don't misclick. Or else, well... This may hurt. <gasps> Act 3. In the pocket M dimension, as I mentioned before, if you have an urge to touch valves, you might lose your entire playthrough. Specifically, if you touch Emergency Flush Protocol, the entire zone will be covered with both lava and death fog, which is fatal to any party, so do not touch it. Just as I mentioned in the lava section, reach the score in one turn, do not delay, and don't choose this line of dialogue. Otherwise, your party will choke on the death fog lava mix. If you side with the Shadow Prince and deliver this box to the Mother Tree, the entire Tersendelius Temple will be covered in Death Fog, which will kill all traitors, Alexander, and any other living being. And do not teleport via Waypoint to the Elven Temple after that, for obvious reasons. Next, Act 4. When you reach a refugee camp before Arx, you may turn left and go up. Here, you'll be greeted by the Loik, the Impotent. There is a lot of Death Fog here, plus Loik himself can TP your guys into it. If you think that Fortify might save you, then think again, because there are some death fog barrels around the area, and Loik might teleport them on top of your head. In the sewers beneath Arx, you're gonna stumble upon this pile of crates. Don't break them for obvious reasons. Next, same sewers beneath Arx. You see those little shitters? Don't come close to them, because when those spooters die, they leave a little death fog cloud. It's super dangerous for melee dudes. And again, Sewers beneath Arx. In the past, during the fight with Isbel, there was a death fog trap in this room with uh, skeletons around it. People would open this door and then choke on death fog. Nowadays, it only releases poison, but due to PTSD, I don't touch this door anyway. Old habit. If you follow Isbel's plan and unleash death fog on Arx, you will turn the city in a ghost town. This will kill majority of NPCs and you won't be able to trade or finish a lot of quests. If you escape from the fight without killing Isbel first, she will release Death Fog in Arcs, which also turns the city in a ghost town. If you decide to break the machine, it will quickly fill this dungeon with Death Fog. So you'd better finish everything you wanted in this area before smashing the machine, and then get out of there very fast with no delay. Do not go AFK here. In the Tomb of Lucian, right before the final fight, you will have to fight puppets which like to pull levers. Some of them can turn you into a cow or, most importantly, release a death fog. Those puppets will randomly spawn some traps and one of them will be a death fog barrel, which could easily break due to the amount of damaging effects in this fight. So never stall in this fight. In order to progress further, you'll need to pull specific levers which spell power. Oh, and it doesn't matter in which order you activate those levers. As you can see, there are plenty of death fog traps in this game, so you gotta be careful. Or just have an undead in your party and completely ignore this section of the video. And finally, let's talk about dangerous encounters overall. Act 1. Don't fight frogs in the cave without any gear and skills. The electric frog has level 16 arrow spell, which can CC your entire party in one turn, and the rest is history. If you want to take an old and smelly captain's armor set, you better be prepared, because the captain has high initiative and he opens the fight with high damage chloroform. On top of that, he summons three dudes with a lot of CC in their arsenal. If you don't want to deal with his charm AoE, then you can dig out his boots in the abandoned camp. But do it before you release him from his chest prison. Alexander's faith aura could be very dangerous, because it boosts damage for his allies. 
Because of that, Geist and Magister Assassin are especially deadly due to their backstabs. Magister Metamorph is pretty annoying because not only she has a very sweet high ground spot, but she can also TP and ship your magic resistance. Keep in mind that during this fight, Voidwoken Worm can vibe check anyone because it has a lot of AoE piercing damage. Plus, it has a petrifying spit. So be aware of that and always keep your magic armor high. On a plus side, it is hostile to everyone, including Alexander's party. If you're not sure that you can easily win the fight, then consider this. Right after dealing with Shriekers in front of Alexander's camp, Gareth will initiate the dialogue with you. In this dialogue, you may ask Seekers for help and borrow a few NPCs to join you in your fight with Alexander. Next, Act 2. Do you remember the dude in the barrel, which you had to squirt out of driftwood? Yeah, um, don't mess with him. Seriously. Be aware of this lamp on the beach. The djinn you summon from it has a lot of CC, plus he's pretty tanky and mobile. So it's a good idea to fight him in an area with no high ground. Next, Vulture Set. If one of your teammates has a captain set, then obviously someone else should cosplay as their parrot. To do so, you combine an Earth Essence, a Raw Mutton, and a Source Orb. Then drop this delicious well done steak to this altar, the giant talking bird appears, and you pick right dialogue lines. In order to do so, read books about dwarven customs and traditions in advance here and here. The thing is that if you screw up even one line of dialogue, you'll fight a pretty high level party, and the bird itself can wipe your entire party with a closed circuit on turn 1, if you're low level. Clay sentinels at the stone garden Surrey crypt hit like a truck. They are easy to kill, but they can be resurrected in groups by two clay sentinels who have magic armor. This is a typical call the ambulance but not for me situation, because if you time it wrong, your turn will be over, then those two clay sentinel lieutenants will resurrect defeated clay boys, which will act immediately and vibe check your entire party. Four sworn heroes at the graveyard. After you kill them, they resurrect in much more powerful form than they were before. Again, the main issue is that if you time those kills wrong, they will resurrect and act last in the same round, and you won't be able to react to it. This can easily get out of control. Necromancer Dog at the Stone Garden Graveyard has high initiative, but most importantly, it summons a skeleton troll. This dude has a 100% chance to apply a knockdown with his basic attacks if he breaks your physical armor. As you can imagine, it's very deadly for a solo character, because if he knocks you down once, you won't be able to get up anymore. Same situation might happen with the Black Ring Summoners on the Blood Moon Island. They summon similar skelly trolls. Oh, by the way, any living troll will also knock you down if they break through your physical armor. Right after the Necromancer Dog, you may enter this tomb. In it, you'd better cast Armor of Frost on yourself before touching these coffins with petrified statues. Otherwise, you'll end up hard as a rock indefinitely. A tier at the end of the Black Pits. Pretty dangerous fight, because Aetira herself does a very high Aero Hydro damage in the big area, which can easily break the armor and CC your entire team. And she can summon. Her dogs do pretty high physical damage, plus they explode on death. So be aware of that if you're standing close to them. Scarecrows near Paladin Bridgehead. It's a very dangerous encounter. Not only these Scarecrows have high magic damage, but also the main guy has a high initiative and most importantly, a terrify aura. Meaning, if your companions lose their magic armor, then they will be CC'd by the terror aura forever. That is because this aura overrides any skill which will try to clear terrify status if you have no magic armor. So not only you'll have to restore magic armor first, but also you'll have to cast something like peace of mind. And you'll have to do this while fighting other scarecrows who break your armor and more of your characters get CC'd. Also at the start of the fight, the main scarecrow will cast uncanny evasion on itself. So good luck hitting him if you're a weapon user. You can also attack the main scarecrow before starting a dialogue. This will give you a high advantage. Now let's talk about Cloisterwood Trio. Number 1, Alice the Burning Witch. She ended a lot of playthroughs for many players because she has very high initiative and absolutely insane damage. If you come here unprepared, she'll kill your shining lights. Do not group up and have high fire resistance. You can also cast Bless on her to remove her pain aura. Number 2, Hanak. First of all, if you agree to help her and succeed, she'll offer you knowledge on how to increase your source. If you accept the deal, then it will remove pet pal talent from the character who agreed to it. You may refuse and find another source master. It's up to you. Now let's talk about her fight. If she escaped to the second floor here, she'll end her life, immediately end your turn and create void portals which summon void woken. You need to pay attention to necro wing void wokens, cause one of them explodes on death and does insane fire damage which 
definitely one shots most of the characters. On top of that, if you break one of those portals, it will end your turn immediately for some dumb scripted reason. But the problems don't end here. Eventually, Hanag will be resurrected. And as you guessed it correctly, she can still summon lava on top of your head, which is an instant death in most cases. So not only this fight has a lot of heavy hitting enemies, scripts which take away your turns, but also lava. With all of that in mind, it's a very, very bad idea to fight her in general. Again, don't group up, have overcapped fire resistance, and think 10 times before fighting her, especially solo. Number 3. Lamenting Abomination This patchwork wolf immediately summons 4 puppies, which can be resurrected by this abomination if they're killed. Keep in mind that these summons give him a stacking buff of Void Howl. Pay close attention to the amount of those buffs, cause it can easily get out of control. If you don't want to deal with this Void Howling, then just bless the abomination. Oh, also, the Abomination has a chance to knock you down with its attacks, and the Old Grey Wolf can use AoE Terrify Scream. In the Lone Wolf's camp, there is one character you have to be aware of, and that's Mummy Dearest. Not only she has high damage and big amount of action points, but she also has insane mobility, and she can walk pretty far. So be aware of that. Keep in mind that the entire Northeast area of Act 2 is under the permanent decay effect, which means you cannot heal there. So do not end your run by chugging health potions or trying to heal someone from the death door. You're just gonna finish them off because of the decay mechanic. To remove the decay shroud, find and kill Harbinger of Doom in the same area. It has extremely high initiative, good mobility and high damage. So don't go there unprepared. But if you decide to escort Mihaly and Elmira, be prepared for a difficult ambush. Cause Mihaly will be in the middle of it and it will be hard to keep him alive. There is a possessed dwarf on the Blood Moon Island, and honestly I always avoid this guy, cause the fight is very wonky, he possesses one of your teammates, they attack you, you attack them, then he comes out, he possesses another teammate, and then you attack them, they attack you. It's kinda annoying and could be reapy if your teammates are pretty strong. But most importantly, if you're doing this thing solo, then it's an instant defeat, because he's just gonna possess your one and only character and we cannot do anything. There are some workarounds, but if you screw up one thing, you're gonna lose immediately. So just avoid this dude if you're doing it solo. There is also a possessed lizard on the Blood Moon Island and uh, the main thing you need to remember is that if you talk to her while having any amount of source on you, she will break free and do very high damage. She can even one turn kill some characters. Next, Act 3. Near the Elven camp, there is a black ring guy who spreads deflection to the entire team. This could be pretty dangerous for a pure solo archer build. The Sallow Man also has a permanent deflection, plus he spreads airborne plague, it lasts for an eternity, and can easily get out of control. But the most dangerous encounter in Act 3 is the fight with your gods. Not only they turn into clones of your party members, they also copy your equipment. As you can imagine, in some party compositions, they can do pretty high damage. And don't forget about random lava eruptions each round, meaning the longer you're gonna drag this fight, the more there will be lava puddles for you to step on. More than that, after you eliminate almost every clone, your gods will turn into a giant source Voltron Megazord thingy. The main threat here is its pyroclastic eruption. This is one of the most broken skills in the game because it throws boulders which do AoE damage at every target in range. The problem is that those boulders can overlap which results in an absolutely ridiculous damage. So if your teammates stand close to each other then there is a pretty high chance they will be one shotted. So you'd better spread out before you try to deal with the last clone. Oh and the cherry on top is that this Megazord has a chance to knock you down with its attacks. Before we continue, I must say that if you want Act 4 to go as smooth as possible, then you'd better follow these rules. Don't lose either Fizz or Magical Armor, cause there will be a lot of CC on the enemy side. Don't group up, and if you can, don't allow enemies to go first. And finally, Act 4. Again, Loic the Impotent. Small Void Woken explode on death and do high damage. Also, there is a Scaly Troll here, which knocks you down with any attack if he breaks through your physical armor. When you enter the fight with the Void Woken near the Gates of Arcs, your turn will be stolen for some dumb scripted reason, meaning you're gonna go last no matter what. Plus, this Void Woken Blood Fury is pretty dangerous and tanky. Additionally, there will be Void Woken reinforcements, which in some cases might steal your turn, so be aware of that. Be extremely careful when you go down in this cellar at the docks. There is a script which will chill and then permanently freeze any character, ignoring their armor. Rewards here are just not worth it. But you can fight this cold by being constantly warm or on fire. For example, in the same cellar, you can teleport this lamp close to you because it makes any character around it warm. 
or if you kept it, use a Tyrant Helmet from Act 1. Source Titans in Kem's Vault are very tanky, plus they can do a lot of damage with reactive armor skill. Lord Kem has a permanent deflection, so it's dangerous for a pure solo archer build. On top of that, you can either confront Kem near his paladins or in his vault. In my opinion, first choice is more difficult due to the amount of opponents, but it has more space to maneuver. Next, Horror Sleep Arena. You'll end up here if you continue exploring Lizard's Consulate. It has a pretty difficult fight against Nightmare versions of Alexander, Melody, and Wendigo. Do not lose your magic armor here, cause Melody can charm your characters for two turns. Alexander can cast a Bouncing Beam, which sets mad on every character without magic armor. And also, he has a single target mad spell. Uh, Wendigo just does a lot of damage. Also, all of them have mobility skills. Additional problem here are the mirrors, which will constantly resurrect mentioned characters. You will have to destroy all mirrors in order to prevent those resurrections. Next, Contamination Set. The main difficulty with this is uh, obtaining a helmet piece in Act 4. Not only the fight for a helmet is pretty difficult, but on top of that, once you got the helmet, you need to put it on only on a character with level 5 persuasion. Otherwise, you will fail a dialogue check and that character will become permanently mad. All your other companions will have to kill that character. And as you can imagine, if you're solo and you screw this persuasion check, you immediately lose. The same permanent madness situation might occur if you decide to go through Silence Broken quest. A silent girl is possessed by a demon, and if you offer yourself as a vessel, you can become permanently mad. And as you can imagine, this is the instant defeat for a solo character. To prevent that in advance, you'll have to find a name of a girl on an old note in the school. Then confront the demon and help the girl to remember her name. Be aware that this action releases the demon and his friends, so you'll have to fight them. The Devourer set. Fighting a dragon solo could be extremely dangerous, cause at the start of the fight, that one character will be locked in a bone prison no matter what for several turns, and nothing will be able to help you to get out of that prison earlier if you don't have a companion to break it for you, and the dragon himself can hit like a truck. You'd better not take loans and make a deal with this girl, cause if you break the blood contract with her, you'll pay for this. Meaning she's just gonna insta-kill you whenever the fight starts. The Doctor. So basically, he's fat and dangerous, the arena is pretty scuffed, and there are a lot of enemies. Plus, if you have Losa in your team, then you'd better do her quest before dealing with the Doctor. Otherwise, she will be charmed in a few turns forever. Which is immediate defeat for a solo Losa character. So, go do her quest. Oh, and if you accept the Doctor's deal and then refuse at the final fight, he'll kill your character immediately. So, don't break the contracts with demons. Karen the Mistake. You can find him in the sewers, locked in a cage. If you release him, you gotta fight him and his undead summons. Karen himself is pretty strong and he can also resurrect his undead friends. On top of that, he steals your turns. If you leave him in the cage, he will eventually escape and you'll meet him in the tomb of Lucian after the Path of Blood. And it's a pretty difficult fight. Karen has high resistances, damage and fire caustic eruption. So if you group up, you die. Again, he has his friends who can be resurrected by him and they have decent both Fizz and Magic CC potential. After the fight, if you have enough persuasion, you'll be able to convince Karen's spirit to give you one talent point. Puppets. As it was mentioned earlier, right before the final fight of the game, you'll have to face puppets and their levers. They're extremely annoying, and the longer you fight them, the higher the chances of them releasing death bug on your party or just turning you into a cow. They also have a very decent damage, good spell arsenal, they can suck your source, and they can be respawned. In order to prevent their respawning, you'll have to use Source Vampirism on them, but they can still summon reinforcements, so do not stall here and pull correct levers to end the fight. The pulling order doesn't matter. In my opinion, this is the most difficult encounter for a solo character in the entire game, if you're not gonna abuse skin grafting or use invisibility before the fight. Alright, that said, like, subscribe, recommend your friends, I stream right here, and check the description. Have a good day.